Hi, my name is Casper Berry, uh, and I'm a speaker and trainer now, a veteran of over 2,000 events. Uh, I'm a former professional poker player, um, and I use that experience to talk about risk taking and decision making, and how people can embrace and understand risk to make better decisions for the future. Hi, my name is Nick Gold. I'm Managing Director of Speakers Corner. We are into our second decade of being one of the leading speaker bureaus of the world. Also, I am the former chairman of the European Association of Speaker Bureaus and in 2017 I'm the co-chair of the International Association of Speaker Bureaus Convention in Las Vegas. I feel I've known you forever and yet I can't remember the first time. So I can Okay. and it's, it's bad that you can't. <laughs> I'm because, sorry. No, well, I'm or rather it's bad that if I, if I remind you because I actually did a, um, you know, like a little trial in front of the, the Speaker's Corner team and you probably blanked it because it was really bad. Oh really? Yeah, it was really bad. What, yeah. Was this in the old office? This was in the old office. Okay. Yeah, it was a long time ago. This was probably about seven years ago. Okay. It's not just you I blanked out. I think I blanked out the whole thing. <laughs> because um, we, we put speakers in, in a, literally in a box and there were five of us sitting probably the same distance we're sitting now. Yeah. And the speaker would be like, come on, performing monkey, do your business. And I, always, I used to sit there more dreading about how they were going to act. And then we had the dog in the office, Sydney in the office at that time. And I remember a couple of speakers, they were speaking and the dog would run in and, they, and one of them was scared of dogs. <laughs> so please, on, even on your worst day, you were still stacked above everyone else. Oh, yes. Wasn't maybe the most conducive atmosphere for a speaker to perform? It's really interesting because that definitely contributed to it. Because yeah. I, I, I was in a, I, I mean, I've done things in my career now in rooms as small as that. Okay. Do you know what I mean? And I think as a speaker, adapting to those different environments is part of the job. I've always got scared whenever I've talked to bureaus or training managers or anything yes. like that. Do you know what I mean? Because you know you're being looked at by people who are experts and so it adds that extra layer of pressure to it yes, I and I was at a place in my no was a, a, for a long time in my career I got was in a place where any kind of pressure would enter quite a vicious circle and I have to be really stern with myself now um, and, and you care deeply whenever you do a speech but I, I have to say that there's just a part of you that has to put that aside that doesn't care do you know what I mean it's not that I don't care mm. it's that you have to you have to forget about that mm. part of you if you want to do a better speech and I, and I advise young speakers of that as well you know there has to be a bit of you that's I think it helped for the irreverence and the jauntiness anyway yes. but but if you care too much you'll just be too earnest you'll start enunciating and saying things in a way that you wouldn't normally do it and it can be your greatest enemy but I remember at the time, kind of, you come in, you were giving us something new and different in terms of, it was almost, you opened my eyes to realistically a speaker who can deliver something funny and amusing and irre irrelevant, as you said, um, but at the same time, when you stop and think about it, there was real contact. Okay. And I think it, it kind of, you along with other speakers, but very much I remember it in the sense that you took us down a direction which we started understanding more about the service we were delivering and the service our speakers were delivering or at least aspiring to deliver. One of the things that I'm massively interested in is clients getting real return on investment out of the, the cost of a keynote speaker. And what I've seen or what we're trying to do is get them to really get gain max, maximum value out of you or another speaker. Or Two days ago I had um, a client say, uh, how, and how much would it be for a seminar as well? And I'm like, no, 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 that's my daily fee. Yeah. You know, use me as much as you want. And actually, I'm not just saying that to be diplomatic. I'm like, I want to leave that space and for you to have not only felt you've got value for money, return yes. on investment, but that people there are gagging to change in the way that, because that's why I do this something. job. Yeah, yeah, do you know what I mean? So the more different ways that I can deliver it, the better. And if someone wants me to come and speak for 25 minutes and then get in the car, I'll do it. Yes. But I'm sort of sad. Yes. You know? And I think this is, if we can influence the clients to really be pushing themselves in terms of, well, how can we get the most out of yourself or yeah. whatever it is? Yeah. Then again, everyone, in the long term, everyone's going to win. So, and I think that all of this is a symptom of something else. Tell me if you've noticed it, which is, you know, when I started, your average keynote was 60 minutes and sometimes 90. Yep. And now your average is definitely 45 yep. and sometimes 60. And uh, I just think everyone has less time for everything. When they get people together for a day, people need or feel the need to cover more topics, yep. more things. There are more internal speakers who want to speak. Um, so that's problematic because we're asking people to give over more time for something when in actual fact they want to give over less to it. And time, you know, is one of the most expensive things there is these yeah. days. But if we can prove a return on that time, then um, it, it's a valid investment. But do, you, do you think one of the issues is the fact that companies are looking at shorter and shorter periods in terms of what their interests are? Definitely. Definitely. And therefore, 
you don't you can't let people breathe or products breathe or campaigns breathe because you've got to prove they've been successful in the short term. Honestly, yeah, I think that has been a big problem for a long period of time. Uh, I actually honestly believe, maybe I'm too optimistic, that uh, nine years away from the great crash, everyone knows it's not going to go back to normal and that different methodologies have to be deployed mm. and actually one of those is that people are open to more long-term ways of thinking now in a way that I don't think they have been in the last 20 years. What we're talking about here in a way is like we're all human, we're all uh, struggling with the same sort of pressures. In my work, right, I talk about risk as you yeah. know, and the natural thing that any company wants, and I know because I want it, because I have to employ people, yes. is I want people to take risks, right? I want them to seize the initiative, I want them to be proactive, but I don't want them to fail. Absolutely. Okay? It has to be no failure when you take a risk. You run a brilliant business here, you have a great relationship with your team and staff. How do you encourage them to feel freedom and latitude to do things, but without fear of doing the wrong things? In order to run your business, you're a control freak, and therefore you want to control. But you have to let people do what they're good at, which is why you employ them in the first place. And that risk, what, what, what you're calling risk, is not really risk, it's actually letting go and saying, hey, hold on, you guys can do this without us. Yes, and for me, it's, uh, it's an investment. Right? You're investing in yes. their own uh, potential, which will grow through their own experience, and the old cliche, some of that experience comes through bad judgment. I want people to come to my business to be part of that journey and enjoy themselves. And therefore, they have to own and feel part of the business, and anyone who do that by only by feel like they have ownership of the whole thing. Um, so they have to learn, and the only way they can learn is by making mistakes, because that's realistically the only way you can learn is by you make mistakes because you're taking that long-term investment over where you want to achieve. So you have to be encouraged to try stuff, and you have to look after them in terms of encouraging them to try stuff, and also by then again managing the fact they don't make their mistakes too big, because when they make that mistake, they'll learn from that mistake and never made that mistake again, and that's the aim. Of that's the aim of a successful business in my eyes. So I think from my perspective, uh, kind of what rings through is I got a question asked, I was speaking to a bunch of students of, about a month ago, and one of them stuck up their hand at the end and that said to me, if there's one bit of advice you'd like to know now, you'd like to know when you were my age now, what would it be? And I kind of, I was put on the spot, and so I, came, I turned around and said, here's what I know now, is that the strongest position you're in is where you admit you don't know anything. And at the age of 21, you, you don't ever want to perceive yourself as weak or um, not understanding the situation. So you'll sit there and you make decisions based on the fact that you want to appear powerful. But you are actually much more powerful when you admit your ignorance and admit, admit your lack of knowledge so you can learn from the people around you. Okay, so my piece of advice is, I think the hardest thing when you start anything, uh, any journey, is, is choosing who to listen to. Because a lot of people say, oh, you know, you've got to take advice. And that's not entirely true, because a lot of people would advise you to become more like them, which is not necessarily what you want. When I started writing, uh, a very famous writer and program maker sort of offered me a mentorship. And I decided, no, not because I didn't like him and his work, but because he worked in television, I wanted to be a feature film writer, which were very different skills. Um, and the three big things that I've learned, um, writing, speaking, uh, and playing poker, were all the same. You have to choose your mentors and choosing which advice to listen to and which advice to respectfully discard are the biggest but most important decisions you make about anything.